I'm sure for the majority of you, Radiohead need no introduction. They've gone down in history as one of the most important bands ever, with the majority of their albums seeing immense critical acclaim, and four of them considered some of the greatest ever. Their constant boundary pushing with every new release and their lack of trend following is what makes them so captivating and surprising when they do something you're not expecting. From In Rainbows being released as Pay What You Want, to the cryptic messages and elements of every release, forming new sidebands or the members' solo work, and of course, the abstractness behind Kid A Amnesia. In 1997, Radiohead released not only their most iconic and well-known album, but also one that some would claim to be the greatest ever made, OK Computer. It was an album that was believed to be musical suicide for the band by their American publisher, but would go on to define the 1990s and be widely considered one of the best albums of that decade, alongside other albums such as Björk's Homogenic, Nine Inch Nails' The Downward Spiral, Massive Attack's Mezzanine, And of course, Nirvana's Nevermind. Just to name a few. It was an album talking about the anxiety of modern day society, consumerism, conformity, pursuit of happiness, and of course, the ever-growing presence of technology and the internet. And it's one of those albums that stays just as important today as it was 25 years ago. This took Radiohead from being a little indie band riding off the sounds of the grunge movement popularized by Nirvana and the Britpop movement popularized by Oasis and Blur to become a band that was defined by its experimental art rock sound. In a way, it was the death and birth of Radiohead, taking what made them good to begin with, but making it a lot more definable to them, whether it was the Bohemian Rhapsody style paranoid android. Peaceful No Surprises, or the horrifying Fit of Happy. No longer empty and frantic, like a cat tied to a stick. They also took inspirations from more unorthodox artists, such as DJ Shadow's drum sequencing. And the ambience on Miles Davis's Bitches Brew. OK Computer was a pretty big leap for the band, and at the time, it didn't sound like anything else around. It either sounded like it was dropped off from a different planet, or it came from the future to warn us. Today, it's widely seen as one of the greatest albums ever, and selling nearly 8 million copies, a huge step up from the predicted 500,000, it is cited by a number of bands as a prime influence. Due to the immense success of the album, Radiohead began touring immensely, and went from being support acts to headlining Glastonbury one of the biggest festivals in the world. This constant attention was too much for the band. Forced to play these massive gigs was terrifying for most of them, who were dragged to stardom by complete accident. They were simple boys coming from humble beginnings, creating rock music because they enjoyed doing it, to then having an album being named an instant classic and possibly the greatest ever made, and then touring for over a year and a half, and then the expectations of a worthy follow-up it was all too much for the band, and nearly broke them entirely. But nobody suffered more than the band's lead singer, T -t 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 Tom York. Um... What was the question again? <laughs> mm. 
His struggles with depression and anxiety were too much for him at times, leading him to have nervous breakdowns, severe panic attacks and nightmares that plagued the majority of his time on the OK Computer Tour. By the time they'd finished, he was mentally burnt out, mistrustful and couldn't do much when it came to the band. I was a complete fucking mess when OK Computer finished. I mean, really, really ill. This tour and the popularity destroyed him mentally, almost becoming catatonic, as seen in the ironically named Meeting People Is Easy, released in 1998. Tom would take up several hobbies ranging from drawing to walking to yoga to try and deal with the immense mental anguish he was in. These abstract feelings were hard to comprehend for him and it didn't help that the band couldn't seem to come up with anything substantial for their next project. Not being able to move forward at the time made them question if they could move forward at all. One of the problems I was having trying to write music, trying to write the words especially, was how I was relating it to my voice. It felt like I'd built myself this fucking maze, this series of moves that endlessly repeat and that I couldn't get out of. So Tom would work in isolation, with a piano and a synthesizer, and was inspired by the ambient works of artists such as Aphex Twin or Boards of Canada. The idea that melody isn't really important, instead, a focus on rhythm and sonic texture. But the other band members were unsure about this approach, considering three of them were guitarists. They experimented with synthesizers, programs, sounds, and things that sounded nothing like they had ever done. And this experimentation would lead to one of the most haunting albums ever created, 2000's Kid A. It was a strange album, coming off the heels of OK Computer, people were baffled by the new direction. It released with no music videos, no singles, just the album. With Kid A, Radiohead had created this barren wasteland in music form with lyricism not really telling a story, instead being random phrases to complement these soundscapes. Even the name Kid A sounds like an artificial intelligence or the name of a synthetic being. Tracks like Morning Bell and Optimistic being reminiscent of what the band had done, and then tracks like National Anthem, which were completely bizarre compared to what they had done before. <laughs> At the time, fans and critics were confused. It was either an intelligent masterpiece of an album, or a complete misstep. Nowadays, it's seen alongside OK Computer as one of the greatest and most important albums ever made, with OK Computer being Rock's peak, and Kid A being its death. A year later, they would release another album in the same style, Amnesiac, an album that was filled with tracks that were considered for Kid A, yet didn't make the cut. And while not as good, certainly is just as abstract and as interesting, with tracks such as the poetic Pyramid Song, the simple but punchy Knives Out, or the hypnotic like Spinning Plates. But across both albums, there's one thing that stands out, and that's the artwork. Hundreds of drawings made by Tom York and longtime collaborator Stanley Donwood, who had made every artwork for the band since the My Iron Lung EP created with paintings, drawings, and the newfound art of digital technology. These artworks were abstract, uninterpretable, and seemed to represent the mental anguish that Tom York went through during the late 90s. They're filled with elements of sadness, fear, and terror in a dystopian world that humanity has created, with screaming or horrified humans, or humans just conforming to whatever. They're both simple, yet detailed meaningful, yet remain almost meaningless. It's reminiscent of the Polish painter Zysław Bestinski, 
who was highly regarded for his apocalyptic artworks he made, inspired by the things he saw during the Second World War at the height of the Nazis' brutal crimes against minorities. These paintings were barren, vague, and represented what humanity was capable of. Tom's art invokes that same feeling of how he interprets his surroundings. It's made to evoke a different emotional response from each person who sees it, and to connect to those who have been in his position. Abstract concepts of crying creatures, jagged lines and shapes, blurry environments that look like they were pulled straight from a dream, scribbles that get a message across, political phrases. Some would even share themes that would later be explored on subsequent albums, such as authoritarianism and conformity on Hail to the Thief, and climate change on a moon-shaped pool. It's an interesting look into the world that Tom and Stanley had created for these albums, and what mentally Tom was like during this time. And it takes what is already pretty colourful music, and adds a whole nother layer to it. It creates this atmosphere that feels like you're drowning and seeing the light just beyond the ocean's surface. They're simply beautiful artworks. These artworks would be spread across album releases, posters and entries on the band's website until 2021, where, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of both albums, they would release an art book filled with these drawings. They also re-released Kid A and Amnesiac as a compilation slash double album called Kid A Amnesia, with a bonus third disc full of unreleased content. The most interesting, I think, is the version of True Love Waits that wouldn't be properly finished until 2016's A Moon Shaped Pool. But they also released one of the most fascinating things the band had released. Kid A Amnesia Exhibition is a collaboration between Radiohead and Fortnite creators Epic Games. Where games are epic! And it's an exhibition of the art from these two albums. Originally, it was conceived as a physical art exhibition, but thanks to COVID-19, that wasn't possible. Though Tom York and Stanley Donwood weren't disappointed by this entirely, and fully embraced the idea of a digital exhibition. Saying, quote, The exhibition didn't have to conform to any normal rules of an exhibition, or reality. It isn't much of a game, but rather an experience. An experience of sights, sounds, and emotions, brought on by the abstract areas you explore, and the extreme dread that the game brings on. All inspired by Tom's nightmares. The game starts in a forest. It seems barren and endless until you find a light entering you into the exhibition. The walls filled with manic scribbles that don't make much sense. Drawings that look like a transition from the forest you just left. And a very blunt message for you. This is not a game. Take your time. You are at the beginning. So there must be an end. Some places will make sense. Some will never make sense. See you later. Continuing on, you find a tunnel, leading to hundreds of images passing through. And further on, you'll find the exhibition's centerpiece. A giant pyramid, with these figures walking around, or crying. There are a number of locations you can explore. A room filled with televisions, a ghost chamber, paper chamber, weird tubes that have these figures just sitting in there, a looping room with lines from multiple songs, a giant static cube that bugs out at certain points in the room, weird hallways filled with lights and figures not really doing anything, and even a room where a miniature is watching live footage of the band. There's this constant fear that you feel as you walk around, whether that's brought on by the strangeness of the artwork the dreamlike areas, or the creepy figures that seem erratic in their behaviour. These things kinda remind me of the variants from Outlast. While some of them are hostile, most of them will just sit and watch you, or be fascinated by something in their surroundings. Unlike Outlast, the figures do not attack the player or do anything to you. They simply are just decoration in a way. 
which makes it even more creepier when they do something you're not expecting. Stopping to look at you, appearing at the end of a hallway, looking at something before looking at you and following your movements. There's giant ones, ones that are enjoying the art and soaking in the atmosphere, ones that are seemingly confused, some that are just going about their day-to-day -day chores, and others who seem tired or burnt out from the constant pressures of modern day life, going in circles. Some of them have faces, while others faceless. Some reacting to your presence, others keeping to themselves. The Minotaur is a tragic figure. It's obviously a monster that kills and eats people, but at the same time, it's that perennial teenage lament. I didn't ask to be born. The atmosphere is something I've never experienced before. This idea of being the only person who's embarking on this journey. Its environments aren't fully understandable, its design purposely uncomfortable. It feels like you're being watched, observed, like this isn't reality. It reminds me of how people describe dreams or nightmares or even those who have died before being brought back to life, with all the themes of their previous albums sort of meshed into each environment. Conformity, consumerism, death, fear. Kid A isn't a horror game, but it's definitely along the lines of one such as Resident Evil or PT. But I believe it could easily be the inspiration to create one. I mean, look at this. There isn't a jump scare, but goddamn, does it feel like there's one around every corner. And then there's the music itself. By using stems to create different mixes of the song, it creates this weirdly personal soundtrack. As you walk around, it reacts to certain things, with tracks weaving in and out as you explore. The static cube glitching out causes the music to change. Answering a phone, you can hear Tom York yelling. Entering the ghost chamber, place fragments of his distorted voice. After a while of wandering around this strange place, you may decide to peek inside the pyramid in the middle, and well... It's even more lightless than the main exhibition. There's a light at the edge, with a weird figure just pacing back and forth, with the only sound that's emanating being the soft taps of its feet against the ground, and the ambience of tree fingers. But as you continue into the light, you end up in an office. There's matrix style text along the wall, and beyond that seems to be a living space, a place to relax, a place for tools, a power station, and even a computer playing an audio visual of Idiotech. Past all this though, you'll find a giant artwork beyond a transparent room, and as you walk towards it, you get lifted off the ground as you float straight towards it, leading to one of the most beautiful points of the entire game. Let That's not me The story of this track goes back to the OK Computer Tour, specifically before the Glastonbury performance. Tom was petrified and didn't know what he was going to do. He had nightmares of being swept away by the Liffey River in Ireland. With another year of touring, Tom didn't know how he was going to deal with all this, until a friend of his, lead singer of R.E.M., Michael Snipe, told him the following. Pull down the shutters and keep saying, I'm not here. This isn't happening. This coping line would be the chorus of the song that Tom said after being asked this question by the BBC in 2006. But if you could pick one song that you'd like to be remembered by, what House would it Disappear, be? Off Kid A. Why? 
because um, it's the most beautiful thing we ever did, I think. The track is a beautiful build-up of emotion and a release of tension, a replication of anxiety builds up before the sudden release when everything is finally okay. This part feels like a beautiful nightmare. You're floating through bits of the artwork as the strings swell and more artworks appear, and Tom York's voice becomes more and more passionate until the climax. <laughs> From here, the game becomes even more abstract, becoming encased in a weird circular structure during pyramid songs. Growing creatures moving in repetitive, yet logical motions during you and whose army. Before you return to reality, or what seems to be reality. It's almost like you fell asleep during this, and the guy around is just cleaning up after hours. You enter a door, there's a blue tunnel with a strange head, as the song like spinning plates plays, before returning to the same barren interior of the pyramids. Now with the pulsating sounds of polk pull revolving doors. With the added extra of an elevator, a strange spiralling room with figures floating through and others walking around the endless spiral. Strange paintings that play with perspective with dozens of these little figures seemingly made out of paper, all upset. <laughs> With the perspective changing as you go up a gondola, you see your body that you've inhabited is actually one of these miniatures. And as it shifts back to your perspective, you make it to the end. But simultaneously, the beginning of Kid A. Art is subjective, it's mysterious, but most importantly, it makes a viewer think. It goes beyond a bit of paint on canvas. It's more about expressing something that's inexpressible through words, because words are severely limiting. They can only get you so far. Artists express these complex emotions through ways that mean something to each person, without explicitly saying something. Personally, I don't think good art is about the detail or the technical marvel of an artwork, nor is it something that takes years to master, but something that to anyone who views can get something from it, whether that's a whole life story or next to nothing. What Radiohead have tapped into with Kid A Amnesia is something I don't think any game or art piece has ever done before. We've had art type games, Firewatch, The Witness, Dark Souls, Paper Beasts, and many more, but I don't think many of them set out to do what Kid A does masterfully. The art is beyond comprehension, it makes you feel isolated, scared and reclusive, a loneliness that can grip you and drag you into your darkest moments. And while there's horror within that, there's also comfort. Comfort from no surprises, nothing to fear and nothing to doubt. And much like a motion picture soundtrack, this experience is just a beautiful fever dream that will have you contemplating it long after the record crackle stops. Stop.